this morning, a full surrender to you, and let our worship be a sweet offering, Jesus.
place, Jesus. And Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal, a stolen your breath, and I sang my own song. Lord, I confess that I'm far from innocent. Shackles I wear I put on my
set aside distractions, God, to give you this time. Help us to open our minds, open our hearts for what you have for us this morning. We are expecting, God, and we are waiting for you to move in our lives this morning. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Good morning. My name is Julie Spear. I'm the family pastor here at One Life. And just get to welcome you to church this morning. I want to take a minute and do a, a special welcome. If this is your first time with us today, uh, we are so excited to have you with us. Come on, church. Let's welcome our first timers. Yes. We, we're just excited for you to be here this morning. I wanna direct your attention, if that's you, if this is your first time, just really quick to the worship guide that's in, or to the connection card that's in your worship guide. And we would love to ask you to fill that out. And we promise that we will honor your contact information. We just wanna send a quick follow-up email, give you some information about how you can get more connected with us, give you some information about all the awesome things that God is doing here at One Life. So go ahead and fill out that connection card for us. We would love to get you more connected. Speaking of all the awesome things that God is doing here, we're gonna check out the news here in just a minute for some upcoming events. We are starting a new series that we are really excited about this morning. So lots still to come this morning. But first, really quick, go ahead and greet somebody next to you. Give them a high five, a fist bump, and then we'll continue on with our service. and I'm the Associate Family Pastor here at One Life Church. We are so glad to have you join us today. If this is your first time, we would love to hear from you. Fill out the connection card from the seat back in front of you or in the One Life app. If you haven't downloaded the One Life app, search One Life AZ in the App Store. You can find sermon notes, ways to get connected, and so much more. Starting next week, we will be changing our service times to 9 and 10.30 a.m. During our 1030 service, we will be offering step one of the growth track. The growth track is designed to help you learn more about the church, how to grow in your relationship with God, and how you can reach your full potential. You could join at any time and can make up any weeks you may have missed. On Friday, August 19th, we will be hosting Kids Night Out from 5.30 to 10 p.m. Kids one year old through sixth grade are invited to join us for a night of crafts, games, pizza, a movie, and more. To register for this free event or to sign up to serve, visit onelifeaz.church slash kidsnightout. All right, One Life Church, very exciting things are happening because this is the sneak peek for what we've all been waiting for. And you know, when I became your pastor almost five years ago, we dreamed that one day we would plant a new campus of our church over here at East Mesa, which is the fastest growing part of our city, so we could reach more people for Jesus. Well, that dream is finally becoming a reality. You know, God has been so good and so faithful to us. And it's with great joy to show you a behind the scenes look of what our new campus will look like for our grand opening on September 11. We'll be transforming this incredible school into a church each and every weekend. This is a great place for children, students, and the auditorium will be an incredible environment for adults to learn more about what it means to fully follow Jesus. So if you know people living over in East Mesa, Queen Creek, and the surrounding area, I make you this promise. You will be proud to invite them to come with you to One Life Church East Campus. And none of this would be possible if it wasn't for you. So thank you for giving. Thank you for serving. Thank you for loving people the way that you do church, we are just getting started. And let me remind you, this equipment, it's not the goal. The remodel happening at our university campus, it's not the goal. Buildings and equipment are just tools to help us accomplish the mission. And what's the mission? Here it is. The church is not a building that we sit in. The church is a group of people on mission to do whatever it takes with the time we have left to reach one more life. Jesus. 
Amen, everybody? Isn't that exciting? Oh man, it was so exciting to be there last week, to be a part of that. And again, thank you for your amazing generosity. We are six weeks away from the launch um, to be one church in two locations, right here on our university campus and also in our East Campus. Um, we can't wait. And a big shout out to everybody that's joining with us right now online, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, our online campus. Come on, church, would you welcome them? Yeah, we love you guys. <laughs> Grateful you're here. I'm gonna dive right in, get your Bibles out to Daniel chapter one. If you didn't bring your Bible, that's okay. The sermon notes that are inside that worship guide or the app, follow along, or uh, they will be on the screen right beside me. And I don't remember the last time when I was this excited to preach a sermon series. Um, it's been several years, and I gotta be like forthcoming with you and give a big shout out to several pastors who preached messages like this, wrote books like this. So Larry Osborne, Chris Hodges, Josh Howerton, learned a lot from you this summer over the last five months. And now I'm finally ready to share it with our, with our church, Daniel chapter one. Now, culture of compromise. <laughs> we are going to talk about a lot of issues in this series, but we're gonna talk about them in a very straightforward way. Um, we're gonna talk about issues like the LGBTQ. Um, we're gonna talk about woe critical theory. We're gonna talk about race. Um, we're gonna talk about transgender issues. All of the things we're gonna discuss in this series. And I know, and I know, and I know, every time we talk about anything that is borderline controversial, I always get emails saying, Jared, why do you gotta talk about issues like that in the church? And here's why. That if the church won't talk about it, and if the church won't disciple the people, the world will disciple the people. And we are people of God, we're people of the Bible, so we're gonna open up our Bibles and we're gonna let the Holy Spirit speak to us in this, in this series. Now here's what's true. All of us are going to feel feelings in this series. We just will. Here's my encouragement to all of you. When you feel those feelings, pause, ask the Holy Spirit, what's true about what's being said, and Holy Spirit, maybe what are some areas in my life where I've allowed the world to influence me? Maybe what are some areas where I've allowed some compromise to take place? Can we do that together? Amen. Now, I brought my preaching helmet. <clears throat> I wanna thank Concord for giving this to me as we walk around and all the construction that's happening around here. And here's why I'm gonna have this preaching helmet on the stage every single week in this series. It's because as a pastor, when I talk about and I preach about love and forgiveness and grace, I get applauded like a hero. And then when I talk about other issues, I get pounded like a nail. And so um, I'm gonna wear this or have this handy when we talk about some of these, some of these issues. But in order to begin, um, I wanna have us do a confessional. I know we don't do that a lot around here, but I'm gonna say something and I'm gonna have you repeat it after me. And it's a way for all of us to kind of just align our, our spirits together as we begin this series. Are you with me on that? Okay, so just repeat after me. I'm thankful, I'm thankful. that my pastor doesn't tell me what I want to hear, but tells me what I need to hear. <laughs> Amen, everybody? All right, you excited to begin this series? All right, get your Bibles out, Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter one. Let me set the, the background for this. Daniel was 13 to 15 years of age when this book was written in your Old Testament. Um, Daniel grew up in a godly nation in Israel with godly parents and godly heritage and godly values were instilled upon him. And when he was 13 or 15, the nation of Babylon led by King Nebuchadnezzar came and defeated Jehoiakim, and we'll talk about him in just a moment, defeated Israel because of their disobedience. And many of them were led into captivity in, in Babylon. So get the picture, Daniel 13 to 15, godly values, godly family, godly heritage, godly nation. Overnight, seemingly, he's ripped out of this godly society and planted, had to walk 700 miles to Babylon, planted in a godless nation with no values, no heritage overnight. In fact, we would just say today, our, our words around that would be he's a victim of human trafficking. 13 to 15, ripped from his home, put right into Babylon. This happened around 600 BC. And maybe you're new around church and you're new around one life and you're thinking, 
Jared, that happened almost 3,000 years ago. Like, what in the world does Daniel, 2600 BC, what does that have to do with us right here, right now? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Now, I'm about to talk about something for just a few minutes that's gonna be weird for some of you, especially if you're brand new around here. I'm gonna talk about demons. I'm gonna talk about evil spirits that are at work right now in, in the world. As people of the Bible, we should talk about things that are in the Bible. Wouldn't you agree? So I need you to follow up. Put your thinking caps on for me in a moment. I'm going to set this series up, and then we'll dive into Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 1. 600 BC, Babylon, the nation of Babylon, is defeated, never to appear again on the face of the earth. But throughout the New Testament, disciples, Jesus, John, in the book of Revelation, talk about an entity called Babylon. If I'll give you an example, 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter, who was a disciple of Jesus, says, she who is in Babylon, Babylon doesn't exist, what's he talking about? Chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son, my son Mark. Now, I'm going to give you one more example, and I'm going to go to the book of Revelation. Now, every time I talk about the book of Revelation, I want to give you a disclaimer, because not everything in the book of Revelation is revelation about things that will happen in the future. The Bible talks about the natural world and the unseen world. So the natural world is what we see, taste, touch, smell, feel. That's how we base our world around. But the Bible talks about an unseen world that is affecting the natural world. Are you catching my drift? That there is a supernatural, demonic influence that is happening around, that's affecting what we're actually experiencing and actually what we're seeing right now. Okay, that's really important. The Bible in Revelation 12, 13, and 14 talks about Jesus coming back and defeating an entity called Babylon. Now, the Bible is not just an old book. The Bible is a timeless book means it just doesn't talk about what has happened. It talks about what will always happen. So with that in mind, Revelation chapter 14, a second angel followed and said, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, not a nation. Babylon the great, which made all the nations of the world drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Another translation says the maddening wine of her Immorality. It also talks in Revelation that Babylon, the spirit of Babylon, that it is set out to destroy the offspring of the people of God. Now, let me land the plane on this, on this issue before we dive further. Do you remember when Jesus was about to go to the cross and he looked at Peter and he said, get behind me, get behind me, Satan. Now, he wasn't calling Peter Satan, He was talking to the spirit that was influencing Peter. In the same way, when the Bible, when Jesus, when John talks about Babylon, it's not talking about a nation of Babylon, it's talking about the spirit of Babylon that's influencing all of the nations. Revelation 12, 13, and 14, not a physical kingdom nation of Babylon, the spirit of Babylon that's influencing all of the nations. Here's why this is important. Because as followers of Jesus, as people of God, we are not at home, we are not at Israel in this world. We are always in exile in Babylon. And that's really important for you to understand. And now maybe you're like, What in the world did I walk into today? I thought this was supposed to be a great series, and now you're talking about demons and Babylon and spirits that are at work. Like, hey, that's the bad news. Here's the really good news. Daniel is a book that was written. It's a a warning, and it's a roadmap to show us how we can stand firm, how we can influence the culture around us, especially the culture of Babylon that is at work in our nation right now. This is a roadmap to show us how we can thrive in a godless society. And I'm really excited to preach this message, these five messages to you. You don't want to miss a week. Okay. All that shared and said, the spirit of Babylon that is at work right now. Let me say one more thing. It has always been at work since the fall. Let me prove it to you. Daniel chapter 1, follow along. 
in the third year of the reign Jehoiakim. Now, when you come to a word like that, you just got to say it fast and strong, right? Like, let's get through it. Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, Jehoiakim, really bad guy leading a godly nation. He was loved by men, despised by God. Here's why. He told the people what they wanted to hear and led them where they thought they wanted to go. Jehoiakim, really bad dude. At one point, takes a scroll and rips in front of the prophets, the scroll right in front of them. Loved by men, popularity off the charts, despised by God. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim because of his disobedience, because how nasty he was, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. Israel falls, Nebuchadnezzar wins, takes the articles to the temple of Nebuchadnezzar's God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Next verse. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch. Do you all want to know what the Hebrew word for eunuch is? It's unicorn. Just kidding. That's actually not true at all. I just feel like we needed a laugh. <laughs> um, eunuch is basically you take your male parts and they're, and they're gone. That's what a eunuch is. To bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Now, <laughs> this is Amanda's favorite verse about me. Who were these men? Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve. You know it's true. Qualified to serve in the king's palace. Come on, if you're gonna clap, you gotta commit. Come on. She is so mad right now, you have no idea. He was to teach them. Here's what's happening. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. So Daniel and his three friends, this was a cultural, cultural engineering project that we're gonna take you out of everything you've ever known, this godly nation, and we're gonna put you and educate you for three years. <laughs> the goal was not to educate them on Babylon. The goal was to make them Babylonian. In fact, so much so that in verse six, the next verse, I'm not gonna read it. I'm just gonna put it on the screen and show you what it is. They not only changed their godly name, which was the connection to the God of Israel, they gave them different Babylonian names to rename them, re-identify them. Here's what happened. Daniel, Yahweh is my judge. That was his Hebrew name. Changed to Belteshazzar, which means treasure of Baal. Check this out. Hananiah, Yahweh shows grace. Shadrach, under the command of Aku, which is the moon god. Mishael, who is like our god, was changed to Meshach, which means, again, who is like the moon god. And in the last one, Azariah, Yahweh is my helper, was changed to Abednego, and that means slave of the god Nebo. This cultural engineering project to take everything that you've ever known, to, you've ever identified with, and to completely educate you, indoctrinate you, to make you Babylonian. Now, I'm going to fast forward just a little bit in this, in this message and tell you that this cultural re-engineering program utterly failed. Do you want to know why we know this? It's because Daniel, the author of this book, never one time does he ever name himself or write himself in as Belteshazzar. It's always his Hebrew name, Daniel. In fact, uh, scholars have known this for a while, but in the early manuscripts of the book of Daniel, all of the Babylonian names were misspelled. A letter was missing here, a letter was missing there. And what they thought was, well, you know, <laughs> probably the scribal heirs have made a mistake when they were transliterating and, and we'll just, they just made a mistake. But when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls and they began to unearth the scrolls of Daniel, they realized, oh no, no, that was no mistake. Daniel purposely left out words and letters of the Babylonian names just to prove. I actually think he's like writing it and saying, ah, 
Babylonian name. I'm not going to say it. Like, forget this. Like, here, here we go. I love that so much. That is such an incredible thing that they spent all of this time and all of these resources for over three years to re-engineer them, to indoctrinate them, to make them Babylonian. And their cultural re-engineering program utterly, utterly failed. Isn't that good news? And so here's the thing. This is a two-part message in, like, or one message, two parts. I was going to try to all fit it in on this message, but there's just no way I can. The first is the reason why Daniel and his friends were able to stay strong to their convictions in their godly heritage is because they understood and they knew the ploy or the strategy of the school of Babylon. And so if we're going to stay strong in this, in this culture in which we're living, we have to know the strategy of the evil spirits of Babylon that are at work. Hey, parents, if you want to parent your kids in this culture, you need to know the strategy. Hey, students, if you want to stand strong in your faith in high school and in college and young adults, and I can go on and on and on, you need to be aware, self-aware of the strategy that is happening right now in our, in our culture. Now, let me fast forward 70 years. Daniel 13 to 15, 70 years later, he rises to be the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation in the world. You can influence your culture by staying strong. Godly people, we can still have godly influence even in Babylon. So take your notes out. Let me give you the strategy. Now, I'm going to need you for the next 10 minutes to wear the preaching helmet. You with me? Here's the first thing that the spirit of Babylon will always do. Number one, write it in. It is separation. It's separation. Well, what, what happened to those four guys? Removed from their godly home, godly heritage, godly values, and sent away, separated from everything that they've always known and put in in Babylon. Why? Because if I want you to walk a new way, I'm going to put you around different people and make you think a new way of thinking. And by the way, when you're separated from godly friends and a godly culture, like we do stupid things, don't we? When you get around stupid people, you do stupid things or you do stupid things when you're alone, which is why we get the phrase, hey, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Hey, newsflash, chlamydia doesn't stay in Vegas. It doesn't. What do they want to do? Hey, let's separate you from everything that you've ever known, from the godly people, from your home, from people who raised you, who instilled these practices upon you, and let's put you in a new place and make you think a new, a new way. As a college young adult pastor, when I first got out of seminary, and I see this happen over and over and over again all the time now. So what happens is that people that grow up at One Life Church, and they go away to college, and the first thing that they do is they begin to sleep in on a Sunday morning. I'll just stay at Bedside Bible this morning and they begin to drift from the people of faith. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I, I should market this. People will drift from the people of faith before they will ever drift from their faith. Do you wanna know why people are saying, I don't really know if I believe that stuff anymore. It's because they drifted from the people of faith. So parents, some of you probably aren't gonna like this, but I don't care. If you have teenagers living in your home, and you think it's your job to be their friend and I just want them to like me, you are doing them a disservice. Your job is not to be their friend. Your job is to be their leader. Whether they wanna to come to church or not, bring them to church to hear the word of God. Do not allow your teenagers to drift from the people of faith. Amen. Separation. If I just separate them, get them away from the people of faith, then I can re-engineer their brain. Then I can make them think different things. Let me just say one more thing. This is a ploy of the evil one and the spirit of Babylon for sure. Because the evil one knows the quickest way to destroy a church is to bring disunity in, into it. Which is why we fight for unity like crazy around here. Which is why we're okay with all of us coming at different views and different opinions. Like we're not going to allow minor issues to separate the people, the people of God. The spirit of Babylon always wants to bring separation. The spirit of God wants to bring unity. Separation is a clear sign of the spirit of Babylon working. Here's number two. 
wear the helmet, and it's replacement of the family. If I take you away from your family, the people that instilled all these principles into you and make you think a different way, then I can re-engineer you. This is always what the spirit of Babylon does. And there's, there's two things that always happen since the beginning of the fall, and write this in your notes, the replacement of the family, here's how he does it, here's how the spirit works. Number one is he attacks healthy human sexuality. He attacks healthy human sexuality. And this says like God created them male and God created them female. The spirit of Babylon is always going to attack that. Do you remember verse three? Daniel goes to work for the chief eunuch. Every conservative Bible scholar would agree that when that happened, Daniel himself. So what was the first thing that happened to Daniel when he arrived to Babylon? It was gender reassignment surgery. And you're going to hear things. People will say, no, no, no. It's not male and female. It's not binary. It's not X chromosome and Y chromosome. Jared, don't you know now, 2022, that sexuality, it's more like a spectrum. Let me tell you what's happening behind the spectrum is the spirit of Babylon that's at work. In church, you need to be aware of that. The Babylonian spirit always attacks God created them male and female. It's the spirit of Babylon. Here's the second thing. The spirit of Babylon seeks to kill children. Revelation 12, 13, and 14, the immorality and what else happens? The spirit of Babylon seeks to kill and to murder the offspring of the people of God. Scholars have known this for years. The Old Testament, there was a small pagan god called Molech. How did you worship Molech? You worship Molech by bringing your newborn infant and sacrificing them live on his altar. That's how you worshiped him. Moses and Pharaoh, do you remember that there's the spirit of God, but there's the other spirit that moves? But when the other spirit moved on Pharaoh, how, how did that spirit move? Pharaoh sent out an edict that all of the babies would be killed. Fast forward to Jesus, Jesus is born. The spirit moves to Herod, what happens? Herod sends out an edict that all of the babies under a certain age in this region need to be killed. Fast forward to Revelation 12, 13 and 14, that the spirit of Babylon seeks to kill the offspring of the people of God. Let me connect the dots for all of us. In America, it's called the American abortion industry. And it is a spirit of Babylon. And we're all so bent out of shape about laws and this and all that. And listen, we should, stand for the, we should stand for truth, we should stand for justice, all that is true. But you need to know what is working underneath of it is not a politician. What's working underneath of it is the spirit of Babylon. It's been working since the beginning of the fall and it is working in our culture right now. The spirit of Babylon wants to destroy the family unit. Connecting some dots for you, everybody. Here's the third thing. It is indoctrination. The spirit of God wants to give us indoctrination from the word. The spirit of Babylon wants to indoctrinate us from the world. Which is why Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not conform. I just think he's talking to young people. I don't know that for sure. I just assume. Do not conform. Everybody say this to the pattern. That's a clay mold that presses in and you become what you, they press into you. Paul says, hey, don't conform to the pattern of this culture, to the pattern of this world. Well, how do they, how do, they do this? Now, again, preaching helmet. I'm gonna to try to just to bring some awareness of what's happening in our world today. Here's the first thing of how they're trying to conform us or mold us into their pattern. Here's the first thing, it is choice architecture. Choice architecture. Now, this is when they have categories created by the world, which by the way, if you're gonna like have to choose between a category that the world created if you're gonna allow the world to dictate those categories, then you're always gonna to come to the world's conclusions. P 
People of God, people of this book, people of faith. Just because the world puts a category on you does not mean that you have to be in that category. We are to be different than the categories that a secular society is putting on us. Because here's what you'll hear. Here's the questions that people will ask. Hey, are, are you for women's rights or are you pro-choice? Like, like, what? I have to be in either one of those? Or, 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 or this, are you for socialism? And, and are you for that? Or, or are you racist? Or are you a bigot? Are, are you for um, men competing in, in women's sports? Or, or, or are you like that nasty masculinity, that patriarchy type? But they're creating categories for us that we have, to, we have to abide by. So people of God, let me, let me help you with this. You can be for women's rights and against abortion at the same time. Did you know that? You, you can be. It's amazing. You can be against a social platform and you can oppose racism and bigotry. Like you can. We do not have to allow the world to put their categories on us, we are people of this book, which means the categories don't necessarily apply to us. I'm helping you. Choice architecture is a clear way because you'd be like, well, I don't know who I am. Maybe I am this. And every time you go to a world's categories, you're always gonna have a world's result. And you're seeing it play out in politics. It's hyper politicization. Everybody's trying to force you into a box. Don't be deceived. Be people of discernment. Choice architecture. Here's number two, and this is repetition enforcement. In Nazi Germany, World War II, uh, the axiom was if you say a lie long enough, people will begin to believe it. And they would just drop propaganda from airplane um, over and over and over again until people actually believed it. Now, we don't drop propaganda from airplanes, but you know what we do today in 2022? It's hashtags. Hashtags. The hashtags like, hey, you do you. Love is love. Good vibes only. <laughs> Stand on the right side of history. You ever, you ever seen those hashtags? And they sound so good, don't they? Like, yeah, we should stand on the right side of history. And love is love. And we should, behind every one of those hashtags is a loaded worldview. People of God, I need you to be discerning. The spirit of Babylon is working. We should not seek to live on the right side of history. We should seek to live on the right side of eternity. Amen. History will be judged by the spirit of Babylon. Eternity will be judged by the son of God. And I just fear that we are so convinced that we have to live after hashtags, but how about people of God, we live after Bible verses and not hashtags. Amen, everybody? This is how we do it. If you don't do this, then you're that. You should put this hashtag on everything if you really mean it. And we're falling into the world's trap, the spirit of Babylon. Here's, here's the next one, and it's packaging. It's packaging. Oh, Lord. All right. So, you ever, you ever hungry and you go to your pantry? Now, we have three little kids. <laughs> and so we have fruit snacks. And I know they're bad for you. Don't come, don't tweet at me like you shouldn't let your kids do that. But you think, like you're hungry, you're like, oh man, I would like a piece of fruit and it's a snack and this is healthy, right? And then you turn it over and you read the label and you're like, wow, this is just high fructose corn syrup and food coloring, this isn't healthy at all. But they make you believe something the way they package it, but when you have your discerning lenses on and turn it over, you begin to understand all of this junk that they're trying to make you swallow. I'm gonna give you two examples. And all of you are about to feel some feelings in this church, all of you. Here's what I'm gonna ask. As all of us feel feelings, regardless of what political side we're on, I need you to ask the Holy Spirit, what is true about what is being said? And Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me in this moment? Here is how Babylon, here is how the world packages certain things. Now, here we go. This is the first example. This is January 6, 2021. This is the attack on the US Capitol. 
Now, I'm not standing here and saying that you shouldn't be for election integrity. You should be for election integrity. I'm talking about that. What was packaged as freedom, and we all like, yeah, freedom. If you begin to turn it over and you read the ingredients, it was violence, open anarchy, and open rebellion. And good people, freedom, saw how it was packaged, and they never read the ingredients. It's the spirit of Babylon. Now, if you hated this illustration, you're going to love my next illustration. And if you love that one, you're going to hate this one. And I'm going to talk about race for just a moment, specifically Black Lives Matter. Now, every time a pastor talks about race, do you know what conservative biblical people like myself automatically assume? Oh, he's talking about woke critical theory. Just so you know, you should have your discerning lenses on with woke critical theory. You should. You should. But not everything that's talked about in race is automatically just, well, that's woke and that's critical theory. That's not it at all. Okay? As people of God, we are commanded to be all about racial reconciliation. In Ephesians, he came to bring the dividing wall down that the two, Jew and Greek, who hated each other's guts, can become can become one. So we should be about racial reconciliation here at One Life at One Life Church. So everything that's talked about race does not necessarily mean it's woke and it's critical, it's critical theory. I want to talk about Black Lives Matter as the organization. Because you can be for the cause. Like we can say Black Lives Matter, just like we can say unborn babies' lives matter. We can say that. In fact, Tony Evans, who's an African-American pastor in Dallas, Texas, so eloquently said that, you, that Black Lives Matter is both a cause and an organization. That you can be for the cause and against the organization. So as you begin to understand, again, how it's packaged, how the world wants you to think, okay, well, what is the purpose? What is the missional statement of this organization? Now, they've since taken this off because they lost a bunch of funding for it. But if you go all the way back to 2020, this was the mission statement of Black Lives Matter. It's on the, from their website. And this is what it is. I want just to bring you aware of this. We make space for transgender brothers and sisters to participate and lead. We do the work required, check this out, to dismantle cisgender. So this is my words, God-given biological sex. Privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women. Now, this is a worldview called intersectionality, which means all the people, and it's about being oppressed and an oppressor, or who are the most oppressed people in history? Black people, women, and trans folk. So our goal is to uplift those three people into power because of all the oppression that's happened. We build space that is free from sexism, misogyny, and environments in which men are, are centered. They want to say, we dismantle the patriarchal practice that requires mothers to work double shifts so that they can mother in private, even as they participate in public justice work. Let me tell you this. I actually think that's a good thing. Here's why. If we fix dad, we don't need a bunch of government problem or programs to fix dad. Like, let's fix dad. Let's get men right. You want to know what makes angry, bitter women? Bad dudes. Amen. Fix the dude. The mommy doesn't have to go work double shifts and take care of the. If dads would step up and take the responsibility of, of fathering their kids, we wouldn't have these problems. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. This is their purpose statement. We foster a queer affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative, that's male and female thinking, or rather the belief that, that all in the world are heterosexual unless she, he, doing the pronoun thing, discover, discover otherwise. All that shirt and said packaging, it's a clear sign of that we're living in a Babylonian time. And let me say this, everything that's done under the word justice does not need to be accepted. Just like everything that's done under race does not automatically make it woke critical theory. People of God, Open your eyes. The spirit of Babylon is working right now. Here's the last thing. This is the school of Babylon. I'm almost done. I'll land the plane. And it's incentivization. 
in, where they said, hey, hey, Daniel and your friends, if you do all the things that we require you to do, you live, you go to school, all of this. Um, in, in fact, I could even see them saying, hey, if you, you can hold on to 95% of your core beliefs, but I'm gonna need you to compromise on this 5%. Then if you do that, then we're gonna give you a really good job. And you're going to have a gigantic salary. And we're going to take care of you. Modern day, hey, if you tweet this, don't tweet that. Use this hashtag, don't use this hashtag. If you fly this flag on this month, then your business is going to grow. Then, then you're going to get a bunch of likes on Instagram. If you do the things that we're asking you to do, hey, you can hold to 95% of the things that you hold dear, but I'm going to ask you to compromise on these last 5%, and then you're going to get all of the, they're going to incentivize you with all of these types of, of things. It is a clear sign that we are living in, in Babylon. <laughs> I know you're thinking, you're like, oh my gosh, here. I see it. Like, I've never put words around it, but oh my goodness, we are living in, in Babylon. What do we do? Like, how do the people of God survive in a Babylonian culture? Here, here we go. Daniel went to their school. He read their books. He worked their job and he made a big salary from Babylon. But there came a moment in his life when Daniel said, I'll do all of this, I'll live in Babylon. But Daniel, he drew a line in the sand. I, I'll do all of this, but what you're asking me to do here, I cannot compromise my core beliefs in this area. I'll go to your school, I'll work your jobs, but this, the line, the line is drawn. Daniel said, I will not defile myself. Verse eight, follow along. But Daniel resolved, I'm not gonna defile myself with the royal food and wine. Now, no, check this out. This is really important. W what did he do? He, he, what? He wasn't a jerk. He didn't blow people up. He didn't say, well, you don't, I can't believe that you would do this. No, 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 look what he did. He asked. If you're gonna be a jerk, guess what? They're gonna be a jerk back, right back to you. If you're not gonna be kind, they're not gonna be kind. People of God, learn from Daniel. He, uh, here's how I picture it, going in and saying, hey, I, I know what you're asking me to do, but there's a moment in my life, I just can't do that. And, and I wonder if I could still make you a bunch of money, if I could still do these things for you, but when it comes to this, I just can't compromise this core belief in my life. Like, would you be okay if he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way? But what, what was all this about? Well. Daniel, he grew up at One Life Church. And Daniel was as part of our amazing kids ministry. And he knew that in Exodus chapter 34, that he was not to eat meat that has been sacrificed to, to idols. And in Leviticus chapter seven, because he was really smart, he knew that there was two types of meat that you couldn't eat. Daniel made the decision, I will not defile myself. I will not eat your food that has been sacrificed to the wrong God. I'll do all of these things for you, I have no problem. But this, this is a line that I am not willing to cross. Hey, One Life Church, there will come a moment in your life when you will have to draw the line. And you will say, I will not do that. Hey, students, college students all over the room, look at me, look at me, look at me. If you have not done this yet, you will do this in a moment, in a, in a season. You can say, I'll go to your school, I'll read your books, I'll attend your classes, I'll go to your seminars, I'll work your job, I'll make you a bunch of money. But this, what you're asking me to do, that compromises my belief and my identity in a holy and true God. And I am not able to do that. Here's, here's what happened. As soon as Daniel drew the line in the sand, you know what happened? God lifted him up. 
In fact, I love this. Daniel chapter one, verse 18. At the end of the time, so three years are over, the social engineering project failed. The king uh, brought them into his service. The chief eunuch presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. Check this out. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and all the enchanters in his whole kingdom. I think God's looking around. All right, One Life Church. Who's the man? Who's, who's the woman that will be willing to draw the line in the sand? Who's willing to say, I'll do this, but I won't do, I won't do that. I'm telling you, the God of heaven and earth, the God of creation in the right time, he will lift you up. There is almost nothing that God won't do for the man or the woman who will stand for truth, who will stand for justice. Do I know how we did this? This is next week, I'm gonna newsflash. The way that Daniel was able to rise to this power is because he was different. In order for us to make a difference, we have to be different. There's almost nothing God won't do for their man or woman. Hey, the same God of Daniel is the same God that we worship today. So I'm gonna ask you a question. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you in this moment? Maybe what area of compromise, what area of compromise in your life? Maybe it's one of those four. Maybe you've never seen it before, but in this message, there's some areas. Maybe you've allowed the world to put you in a box and define you. Maybe you've allowed your politics to get in the way and now you're understanding, oh my goodness, what's happening around me? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you in this moment? Some of you today, it's time for you to draw the line in the sand. Will you pray with me all over this room online? Turn off every distraction. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Holy Spirit, you see the hearts of your people today. You see what we're doing, how we're acting, and even how we've allowed our culture to sway us and to move us. And now I pray, Holy Spirit of God, right now in this moment, that you would open up our hearts. Lord, and as you speak, that we would respond, that we would say yes to you. Those areas where we've compromised, those areas where we've allowed the culture to define us, oh, Holy Spirit, we repent of that. We release it in Jesus' name, and now we ask you to fill us. We want to make a difference in this culture of compromise. Today, we're drawing a line in the sand and we're trusting that you will lift us up because the same God of Daniel is the same God we worship today. In Jesus' name, amen.
that is our prayer. Oh God, we need you right now more than ever before. We wanna stand strong in this ever-changing culture. And we commit today to draw a line in the sand and trust you that you will lift us up. Thank you that we serve the same God of Daniel. Oh God, we need you now more than ever before. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Come on church, one more time. Would you give God praise for his goodness? Yes. So good, so good. Hey church, while you're clapping, we're gonna dismiss you in just a moment. Um, hey, but let's go ahead and worship the Lord through the giving of our tithes and offerings right now. Aren't you excited to do that? However you give, in the boxes in the back, online, through the app, thank you for your amazing and your continued generosity. Um, and if you're brand new around here, you wanna know what a next step is? Next Sunday, after the 9.30 service in the Growth Track room, we'd love to help you take a next step and get on the Growth Track and help you know God, find a friend, discover your purpose. Um, we are here to help you take that step. Now, next week, I told you this was part one of a two-part message. Um, do not miss next week. This is how do we thrive in, in Babylon? That was the school of Babylon. Now, what do we do? How do we thrive in, in this school? Um, you all know somebody you need to invite to bring to this sermon series, right? All right. You are commissioned in Jesus' name to have boldness and courage to share this and to invite somebody to come back with you, come back with you next week. Amen, everybody? Okay, let me pray a prayer of blessing over you. I'm late in Jesus' name. Lord, I, hope, I pray the family ministry team won't kill me. And Lord, I thank you for every person that's in this room. God, you are doing something special here. We sense it, we feel it, and we hold nothing back. We invite you now more than ever to move on in our behalf. And I pray, Lord, that we will have the most amazing Sunday afternoon that we've ever had. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, I love you. Keep coming back. We'll see you next weekend. God bless you.